Hello, it's Martin from Wisely Automotive and in this video we will be discussing everything to know about the BMW i3 suspension. It's quite often a very passionately discussed topic because there are many versions of the i3. We've got the different battery sizes, the 60, 94 and 120 amp hour. Also, some of them do come with the range extender, some of them don't. And later on with the facelift, BMW introduced a dedicated sports version so I will show you the general setup and how the suspension differs between all the different versions. We have taken the wheels off on this 120 amp hour, which is still undergoing preparation, which would make it a bit easier to show you all the suspension components. Starting with the front, we've got a Macpherson setup. Generally speaking, it's one of the mechanically simpler setups. In case you're not familiar, the wheel carrier, which is the part which holds the brake assembly and the wheel itself, is supported by a single wishbone on the bottom and also mounts through the spring, the damper, all the way through the top mount into the chassis itself. Despite it being a mechanically simple setup, usually used by manufacturers to lower the cost of production and save a bit of space, it is the area which can cause some problems on i3s. The gaiters on this one are absolutely fine. The gaiter is just a rubber damper cover but it's one of the most common failures we see. It's not necessarily an MOT failure, but something to definitely look out for, and it's the number one thing we check when an i3 comes in. Similarly, a bit less frequently, the top mount is basically a bearing which allows the wheels to rotate left and right as you turn the steering wheel. Over time, they can wear out, which can cause a creaking noise. The only solution, unfortunately, is to replace the top mount. Both the top mount and the gaiters are not necessarily expensive parts, so most of the costs associated with replacing them is due to the labor because the entire assembly has to basically come out. The last part to note here is the anti-roll bar, also referred to as the stabilizer. It's basically a rod connecting the left, right front suspension and the car itself. This means that in cornering it will try to keep the vehicle flat and it's the tuning of all of these different components which determines how a car handles and feels to drive, but we will get on to just a second. Before we do that, let's take a look at the setup in the rear. We've got fully independent left and right suspension thanks to a multi-link setup. As the name suggests, the wheel carrier is held in place by multiple links or wishbones or control arms, and some of these do have a degree of adjustment in them, which is what gets worked on if you need to get the alignment done on any car. What's important for the purposes of this video is that with the left and right side being fully independent, if you hit, for example, a pothole on one side, it will not transfer to the other one and upset the balance of the car. Secondly, unlike the front where we basically have a single pivot point and as the wheel goes up and down, it creates an arc movement. Here on the back, the whole purpose of the multi-link setup is that it keeps the camber angle, or in other words, the angle at which the wheel meets the ground consistent, or in other words, the tire is always perpendicular to the road surface. And similarly to the front, the movement of the wheel is controlled by the spring and damper. Because there is no rear wheel steering, there are no top mounts to speak of, so no issues with that. And generally speaking, these rear damper covers seem to last much, much longer than the ones in the front and are usually trouble free. I hope I covered all the basics, so let me get my laptop and we will take a look at all the part numbers across the entire i3 lineup. So now time to get the notes out, but before I go ahead with that, there is one important disclaimer to make. The main suspension hardware, so the wheel carriers, the control arms, etc., are all identical across all i3 versions. Those suspension components require the most expensive tooling, so it makes sense that BMW wants to share the same design and the same parts across as many cars as possible. With that out of the way, let's see how the range extender version differs from the fully electric one during the first generation, so the cars equipped with the 60 amp hour battery. Despite the range extender sitting in the back, the front springs are different as well. Front dampers and stabilizers are identical between the two versions. But on the rear end, both the damper and the spring are different on the range extender. Going one step up to the 94 amp hour battery, but still keeping with the pre-facelift car, we have got the same front suspension setup as on the 60 amp hour, so the range extender gets the different spring, but other than that, all versions are identical. 
Moving to the back though, it gets a little bit complicated. The fully electric version got a new damper, but the same spring as the 60 amp hour BEV. Whereas the range extender gets a whole new set of dampers and springs, so none of those get carried over from the 60 amp hour version. Now, let's get to the most important question and probably one of the reasons why you clicked on this video if you are interested in these i3s. And that's the difference between the pre-LCI or pre-facelift version and the facelifted version. In terms of batteries and range and the underlying technology, everything has stayed the same, but many people claim that the facelifted version drives a little bit softer and is a little bit more compliant, especially on broken roads. Well, what does the data say? The exact opposite, in fact. The part numbers are identical between the respective versions before and after the facelift. Given how much talk there has been on the topic, we cross-checked with actual cars and from all of the ones we had, regardless of age and visually on the original parts, they were still identical between the facelift and the pre-facelift. Having sold about 350 i3s, what's our take on it then? Well, despite most of the part numbers being the same across the entire car between the generations, we do think the interior fit and finish, for example, or the manufacturing techniques may have to do with the slight improved perception of ride quality. That's because if you don't hear any rattles in the car, subconsciously it may feel like you are in a more solid, comfortable, better dampened car. An alternative explanation is that most people who bought the facelifts had the previous generation 60 amp hour cars which have picked up quite a few miles over the years and that means that jumping from an early built used i3 to a brand new one may have reflected on how the car feels to drive. Anyways, let us know in the comments what you think about the whole situation and let's just move on because there is still a lot to explore with the facelift BMW introduced the dedicated S or sports version. Long story short, the entire suspension got retuned. On the front end there are new dampers which are shared between the fully electric and range extender version but the front spring, whilst also new, differs between the BEV and REX. Very importantly, for the first time in the i3 history, the front anti-roll bar is also brand new. And that is probably the biggest contributor to the i3S feeling a lot more planted, especially at high speeds and in crosswinds. Just keep in mind, it's not compromise free because you are losing out a bit of comfort. Just like in the front, in the rear the car gets a whole new set of dampers and springs. And in this case, because of the mass being in the back with the range extender, Drex gets a different combination compared to the BEV. The last thing to address is the change from the 94 amp hour to the biggest 120 amp hour battery. This change is quite a bit more significant than all the previous ones because there has been a significant weight increase in the battery pack despite the exterior dimensions not changing. In the UK the range extender variant has also been dropped so I don't have any part numbers for those versions. With the non-S version on the front the damper is the same as in all the previous non-S versions but interestingly, probably because of the extra mass, the spring has been adopted from the previous range extender versions. The front of the Sport version shares the same damper and the stabilizer are carried over from the previous S versions, but it does get brand new front springs. Moving to the back, the setup is identical to the 94 ampere battery version, so no new parts there. And the same goes for the Sports version, which shares the rear setup with the 94 ampere battery only S version from the previous years. Let's conclude all of this because I probably have been boring you for way too long with the part numbers. The key messages in our eyes are that number one, just as we have known for a while, you can't interchange the suspension components between different i3 versions. So if you're looking to work on one on your own or through an independent mechanic, make sure that you get the correct parts for your particular car. Number two, there is no difference between the pre-facelift and the facelift version, at least in terms of the suspension. The other differences have to do with how the car looks and slightly updated tech in certain areas, but we will make a dedicated video on that in the future. And thirdly, even though the big parts of the suspension are shared between all i3s, the S gets a completely retuned setup with brand new springs, dampers and the anti-roll bar. In case you're interested in learning more about these things, I recommend watching our last vlog, which was on our custom BMW i3 in Golf Blue. If you look carefully, that car is not an S car, but we have put the 
S wheels on it with the wheel arch extenders as well. By pure coincidence, when we were converting the car, we did not have any of the sports parts available, so we kept the car on the stock 94 amp hour range extender suspension. And honestly, we really liked the combination of the 20 inch slightly wider S wheels with a tiny bit more grip and the more compliant standard suspension. It's a shame BMW did not offer that option in the configurator. But I think that's all for today. Thank you very much for watching. If you have a different take on this or you have found different information, feel free to let us know in the comments because we are happy to make an updated version of the video if we find out more information. But again, thank you very much for watching and see you in the next one.